Today's message is, is a good one. Are you ready? So every year, here's what I do. I always go back and I look at last year's end of the year message because I've been doing this like for seven years now. And so I go back and I look at last year's message. And so I went and looked at last year's and I told the guys to run the first 23 seconds. Look at what I said. Check it out. I've run into people uh, lately and because of the new year and all this going on, you know, people get all excited and jacked up and pumped up. And I see people come and say to me, hey, Milton, you know, 2020 is going to be your best year ever. How many of you had someone come up to you and tell you that same thing? It's a lie. <laughs> Sorry, brother, you know, but, but it is a lie. It is actually, actually a lie. Okay. So <laughs> now I didn't know what was about to happen. Now, those words were not prophetic. No, I did not receive a word from God. That was just something that I just, uh, you know, based on what Jesus said, in this life you shall have trouble, trials, affliction, but rejoice, I've overcome the world. So this year, people have come up to me and said, hey, Milton, <laughs> 2021 is going to be lots better than 2020. That's a lie, too. That's also a lie. That is also a lie. If you have this idea that your purpose on this earth, that your God-given purpose is for you to be happy, you're wrong. That is not the purpose. Now, today's message is going to be surgical. It's going to be like a scalpel, you know, going right into the marrow. And that's not a word of great encouragement, but it's something that is going to help you reflect, to help you start off the new year. If your idea is that God has us here to be happy, you have the wrong idea. Many times, Paul was grateful for the affliction that he had to endure. Because Paul, in a summation, he was basically saying that it was through the affliction and the trials that he had developed a thirst and a hunger for God. James said, consider it what? Pure joy, my brothers, when you have to face all sorts of Trials, please fill in the blank. Remember, when I do this, it's not because I've forgotten the verse. I'm a teacher. I want you to fill in the blanks. Now, if you don't know the answer, then one of your goals for 2021 should be to get into the Word. Because that's what's going to bring transformation. Now, I have to preface by saying this, that I love each and every one of you. I love each and every one of you. And today's message is intended to bring transformation. As we start off the new year, if we take in old habits or old mindsets into the new year, we will produce the exact same outcome, and then we will ask ourselves why. And like Einstein said, right, he said, you know, people do the same thing expecting a different outcome. That is insanity. And so you have to change something about you as you go into the new year. Job found God in the middle of his trials. If you've ever read all 40 plus chapters of Job, you realize that Job suffered. He suffered a lot from beginning to end, but then God gave him back twice as much as he had lost because he was what? Faithful. But there's something that Job says in the middle of his trials as he's out there in the desert filled with wounds and scratching his body with a piece of clay pot. And he's saying, my ears, he said, my ears had heard of you, but now my eyes have seen you. You see, it was in the middle of his affliction that he was able to experience God in a deeper way. If you're not going through affliction or have not been through affliction this year, regardless of pandemics and politics and people, whatever your, whatever your trial may have been, let me tell you that God can work in that and through that in your life to make you stronger, more faith-filled, and to produce a different life in you. You just have to keep your eyes on Jesus. You have to keep your eyes on Jesus. That is the goal. Job found God. You see, we go through a metamorphic change. You know, the word, when, when Paul says to be transformed, the word transformation is equal to metamorphosis. And you remember in school studying the metamorphic changes of a caterpillar into a butterfly. Now, one of the things that you need to know about the, but the butterfly in the process is that once it's in its cocoon, once the butterfly or the caterpillar is becoming a butterfly and it's in the cocoon, part of the process of it becoming a butterfly and being able to fly, 
part of the process of bringing blood flow into its wings, allowing the wings to develop once it breaks free from the cocoon. Part of the process is the struggle. You see, the butterfly has to struggle. The butterfly has to try and wiggle its way out, fight its way out of the cocoon. Nobody can help the butterfly. The butterfly has to push. It has to hurt. It has to go through pain, but it's got to push. And when it pushes and it breaks free from the cocoon, then its wings expand and it does what God has created it to do, and that is to fly majestically. But it had to go through a trial. You see, it had to go through some suffering in order to get to that point. A few days ago, I got to speak to a, a group of businesswomen in the United Kingdom. And I had about 100 or so businesswomen that I was speaking to. And the question is, what is the key to a better life in 2021? <laughs> well, I could pull a Joel Osteen on you right now and give you the five points, but I'd be lying to you. So I won't do that. But these women, because it was a secular conference, I said, if there's one thing that I can tell you to do, one thing that I can advise you as business women to do is to not look back. Don't look back. Once you cross into 2021, do not look back. Thank you for, that, uh, for those two amens. Praise the Lord. Do got it. <laughs> Let me say it again. Don't look back. So the big question is, how do I make 2021 the best year ever? Well, you can't. So you got to stop trying. The question is, how can I be a greater Christ follower? You know, Truett Cathy. How many of you know Truett Cathy or have heard of Truett Cathy? Anyone? Raise your hand. Someone over there in the back has heard of Truett Cathy. Anyone over here? Over here? Chick-fil-A founder. His men came to the table, the board members came to the table, and they said, you know, Truett, back in the 80s, said, Truett, Boston Chicken is talking about building a whole lot of restaurants all over Chick-fil-A to kind of suffocate us so that we end up closing our stores. He said, and they've gotten a big loan from the bank, and they're going to build everywhere. So this Boston Chicken, which is now Boston Market, says they're going to suffocate us. And, and Truett Cathy, man of great wisdom, a Christ follower himself, he was sitting at the, at the front of the table and he was listening to these people talk about how are we going to be bigger and better? How are we going to be bigger was the question. How are we going to be bigger than Boston Chicken? How are we going to suffocate them? And Truett Cathy, with great wisdom and great strength, he just pounded his fist on the table. He said, gentlemen, instead of asking how can we be bigger, ask yourself how can we be better? Because when we become better, our clients will demand that we be bigger. So how does that relate to our walk in Christ? Instead of asking yourself, how can my life be better? <laughs> Ask yourself, how can you be better? How can you reflect? How can you be a luminary for Christ? How can you grow in him? That should be our question. Keep this in mind as you leave this place today. Don't look back. Don't look back, Sodom and Gomorrah. I'm going to use that as, as an example today. Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah was a wicked place, the Bible says. I mean, it was, it was, it was a bad place. It was, it was a cross between, uh, you know, the, the, the uh, Vegas and, uh, and Bourbon Street. It was a cross between the red light district in Amsterdam and the red light district in Hamburg, Germany, which are the worst in the world. That was Sodom and Gomorrah. And as you know, Abraham's nephew, Lot, went to live in Sodom. And he was living there with his wife and his daughters. Now, I'm not going to get into the whole story, but you know a little bit of this if you've been coming to church for at least a year or so. You know that God was not pleased with what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. There was incest. There was bestiality. There was homosexuality. All of these things were happening, and God was not pleased with what was happening in Sodom and Gomorrah. You see, Lot had chosen that place because he saw it up from the hillside and he saw that it looked green and nice. But once he went into it, he noticed that there was, there was more than he could see from a distance. And so God was not pleased. And when Abraham heard that God was gonna destroy Sodom and Gomorrah, he said, Lord, he said, if I find at least 50 good people in Sodom, he says, would you spare their life? He said, go ahead. He went and looked and couldn't find them. 
He came back and said, Father, he says, God, he says, if I can find at least 40 people, he couldn't find them. He went all the way down to 10. He said, if I could find 10 good people in Sodom, would you spare their lives? He said, yes, but he wasn't able to find them. All he found is that Lot and his family were the only good people. And so God said, I'm going to destroy. So God sent two angels to Lot's house. You probably know the story. He sent the two angels. And that place was so messed up and wicked that the men of the town wanted to rape those two angels. That's what the Bible says. And so Lot... The angels come and say, you need to get your stuff and get out of here. Get your kids, get your family. They said, escape, run for your life. Don't look behind. Key word there, key phrase. Don't look behind. You see, they were going to go off to a place called Zor. Zor was a refuge. It was a safe haven. It was a place of peace. It was a place that had already kind of been predestined for them. You go from A to B. Just run. I've already given you a way out, an escape route. Leave. And Lot, he summoned, he went to his in-laws, his son-in-laws, and said, guys, God is, you know, you know fire and brimstone are going to rain down on Sodom and Gomorrah. God's going to destroy. And the, bro- the sons-in-laws laughed. And they said, oh, come on, Lot. Come on, we're living it up here in Sodom and Gomorrah. Everything's allowed. It's all good. The only people that left was Lot, his wife, and two of his girls that were still at home. They were not married. And they escaped the perversion. They left Sodom. But as they were leaving Sodom, Lot's wife, the Bible says, and I have the verse up there, uh, Genesis 19, 26, but Lot's But Lot's wife never made it. She lagged behind her husband and looked back despite the messenger's advice and turned into a pillar of salt. She looked back. Now, we don't know why she looked back. Now, Lot's wife isn't mentioned much in the Bible. Her name is never mentioned. Jesus uses her in the book of, uh, I believe it's Luke 17, 32, 33. He uses her as an example when he's talking. He's teaching a parable and he's teaching the disciples about not looking back, about letting go of the past. And he says, Jesus says, remember Lot's wife. (laughs) Remember, remember what happened to Lot's wife. Don't look back. You see, sometimes we're so... We're so stuck in our history that we're unable to see God's destiny for our lives because we're stuck in Sodom. You see, it was good living in Sodom because everything was allowed, everything was permissible. Now, I don't know if Lot's wife stopped and looked back and looked at her Bentley or she looked at her, at her Dooney and Burks or she looked at her, what else is there, Louis Vuitton. I don't know what she was looking at. Maybe, maybe she was looking at her Rolex watch or at her bigger house or at her investments in the bank or at her friends. Or maybe she was hung up on alcohol and shooting up drugs. Who knows? Maybe she was promiscuous. Who knows? The problem was that she looked back because she couldn't let go of her past. Don't get stuck in Sodom. When you hear the word Sodom, Sodom is synonymous to perversion. That's where the word sodomite comes from. Or, you know, every time you hear Sodom and Gomorrah, what comes to mind? Trash. It's what you think is, is, is something that was perverse. She looked back and became a pillar of salt and she never made it to that safe haven, to that place that God had destined for them. Let me fast forward a little bit there. Let's go on to Israel, to, to Egypt and the Israelites. Same concept. Moses is appointed by God. God speaks to him through the burning bush. He says, go and free my people. Go tell Pharaoh to let him go. And of course, you know the story. You know all the things that happen. Eventually, the people are let go. Moses leads them, and Moses leads them through the waters. God parts the waters. Manna from heaven, quail, there's, there's water coming from a rock. I mean, all these amazing things are happening in the eyes of the Israelites as they're fleeing a two-week trip that ended up taking them 40 years. Now, if I raise my voice, not because I'm upset, it's because I'm passionate. 
because I love you guys, because I want you to hear this message. The Israelites took 40 years, guys, on a two-week trek. And if you were to look at an aerial shot of what they were doing, they were going in circles. They were going in circles, consistent circles. And as they were going in circles, all they did was complain. Well, if you only knew my life. Back in Egypt, we were better off. And actually, if we look at Exodus 14, 12, this is what they were saying. Isn't this what we told you? They're speaking to Moses. While we were, we were slaves to leave us alone, we said it would be better to be slaves to the Egyptians and dead in the wilderness. They were like, we'd, we'd better be better off over there. 400 years, generation after generation after generation after generation of being slaves, they were free physically, but they were bound mentally. They had a wilderness mentality. Brother, I was born on the wrong side of, the, uh, of town, brother. I was born into a poor family, brother. We have no education, brother. We were born to, we were born to fail, brother. Mindset, that wilderness mindset, we're stuck in the past. The Israelites, they desire to stay under the rule and reign of the Egyptians rather than to be free. And those who ended up leaving, the majority did not make it into the promised land. There was a consequence for their disobedience. There was a consequence for their grumbling. There was a consequence. They never made it in. You see, if you're going to pursue Christ, you can't look back. You cannot look back. You have to fix your eyes on the author and the finisher, on the sustainer, on the one who gives us life, the one who heals, the one who provides, the one who is our rock and our strong tower. We cannot look back. You see, Jesus said this in, um, he said, let me find it here. Uh, he said, Luke 9, 62. I'm sorry, I have English and Spanish. I'm doing the Spanish service today, so I've got my notes in English and Spanish. Luke 9, 62 says, anyone who starts plowing and keeps looking back isn't worth a thing to God's kingdom. Example, I shared this, shared this with you guys months ago. I don't know if it was the time around Easter time or when it was, but I shared a message with you guys. And it was recorded, actually. It was during the, those times that the church was closed. And I talked about how my grandfather taught me about plowing. My grandfather was, he, he had a, a small lot in Mexico in a, in, a, in a small little town outside of Monterrey. And, and I was as a nine-year-old kid and I was watching him use an old rusty plow and two oxen. And he was plowing the field, making these perfect rows. So the furrows were beautiful. Everything looked so perfect. And I was intrigued by how he had done this because he had no technology, but just an old rusty plow. And when I asked him how he had done that, he had gave me an explanation that was very, very simple. He says, do you see that each, do you see that there are fence posts that are holding up the fence? I said, I see that. He said, every one of those fence posts is distance out the same distance from each other. I see that. He said, every one of these rows, those furrows, they end up at itch, every one of those posts. I said, I see that. He says, so what I do is I make sure that the first row is, 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 is straight. And then he says, I keep my eyes on the post. And I take, I put my hands on the plow and I keep my eyes on the post. And I, and I walk towards the post as I make sure I don't look to the left or to the right. Because if I do, I will create crooked furrows, crooked, crooked rows. He says, then I have to start all over again. And he taught me that lesson. It was about 20 years later that my father took that same lesson, my dad. And he says, son, remember, remember grandpa telling you that story? He says, well, let's, let's bring that into our life as believers. He says, the post is Christ. He says, and if, you, and if you put your hands to the plow, but you look to the left, to the right, or back, he says, your life in Christ is going to be crooked. It's going to be crooked. And that's why, that's why Jesus here is saying, he says, anyone who starts plowing and keeps looking back isn't worth a thing. In God's kingdom. Well, I'm a Christ follower, or I'm, a, I'm a, you speak Christianese. You walk Christianese. But you spew hate. I love you guys, okay? But can I tell you about the 80-20 principle? 20-20% of you guys in this room are true Christ followers. 80% of you are not. Now, let me just be really plain. I mean, I, I can say these things because I won't see you until 12 months. You'll forget. <laughs> you'll forget. He's like, who is this guy? Who was that guy? <laughs> Could you please put up uh, the first pyramid up there on the screen? 
I want to show you something. I'm a teacher, like I said, I'm an educator, I'm a psychologist, and I teach with uh, a lot of illustrations. Claudia remembers uh, this pyramid many, many years ago when she came to me for, for, you don't mind me saying this, right? For life coaching, and she came to me before working here at the church, and this pyramid changed her life. Of course, you know, Christ changed her life, but this pyramid brought some realization to her life. Please pay attention to the pyramid. And just look at it for, just for, just, oh, you, you did split the screen, so great. So we have at the very top, this pyramid is like what I call, it's not Maslow's pyramid, it's not Maslow's pyramid, it's Milton's pyramid. <laughs> it's Milton's pyramid of priorities. And so if you look at it, the top represents the apex, what is most important in your life, what is the thing that you worship, the thing that you love the most, the thing that you think about the most, the thing that consumes your thoughts the most. That's at the very top. And then going down two, three, four, and five in, the sa- in that same order as your priorities, what's most important, what's not as important, what's not as important, what's not as important, what's not as important, so it goes kind of down all the way down. And so I want you to just think about this, and I don't have a whole lot of time to, to really dive into this, but I want you to, if, if, if you look me up on, and I have, I have a whole thing, uh, a series on, on YouTube called Life Hacks. And, and I explain this really, really well, it's called Life Hacks. Uh, but anyways, if you look at this, I want you to think about what's at the top of your pyramid. If I ask men in life coaching sessions or in, in, in counseling sessions, the men will say, my job, because they're providers, my job. And women will say, my children, you're right, my children. That's what the, and then I'll look at them and I'll say, that's why your life is messed up. I probably told you the same thing. That's why your life is messed up. And was not as messed up? <clears throat> it was okay. It wasn't that messed up. So let, let me show you, like I said, I can't get into this really a whole lot, but I just want to bring some awareness to you. When we talk about not uh, looking back and putting your hands on the plow and making sure you're focused on what needs to be focused on, show me the next pyramid so I can show them what it looks like. That's what it should look like. Take a picture of it. God is at the top. God is at the top of the pyramid. He's at the apex. He is the most important. Why? First commandment, you shall have no other gods before me, God said. Number one. Jesus said, love God with all of your heart, soul, mind, and strength. Number one, plain and simple. I have no more explanation for you. First commandment. And then Jesus said, he reinforced it. Love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. First commandment. You shall have no other gods before me. I'm a jealous God. Number one. Number two. Number two should be you. You're like, what? That's egotistic. That's, that's selfish. No, it's not. The Bible says, Jesus said, love your neighbor as yourself. If you can't love yourself, you can't love your neighbor, period. I don't even have to explain it. I mean, it's self-explanatory. You can't give what you don't have, teach what you don't know, guide someone to a place that you've never been to before. Let me show you Christ and you don't even know him. Let me show you how God loves if you don't even know the love of God because God is love. Is that, do y'all get this? Put your life in order, guys. As you start 2021, God, you spouse, children, not the other way around. It's not children, then spouse, because guess what? I learned this a few years ago. My son, he fell in love. He had his own family. Bye-bye, dad. (laughs) He loves me, and I love him back, but I know that his priority is his family, and that's the way it should be. I shouldn't be his priority. His family needs to be his priority. God said in his word that children are an inheritance. In other words, I only have them for a short time. Train up a child in the way he should go. Why? Because I'm going to let him go. Train up a child. So, for a short time. So, I have to focus on God, you spouse, children, and then work, ministry, ministry, extended family. Okay. You get it? Everybody say, got it. Perfect. Okay. So, so we're, 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 okay. Man, y'all should like invite me like for an hour and a half or something like that. It's tough. Right? Uh, what is your name again? Danielle. Danielle. Okay. It's an inside joke. Remember, Danielle? Okay. The pyramid of priorities. No one drives a car while looking through the rearview mirror. Unless you're going in reverse. <laughs> if you're going in reverse, look through the rearview mirror. If you're going forward, make sure that you're looking forward. Otherwise, you'll end up in an accident. This is what Paul says to the Philippians. 3.13. He says, of course, my friends, I really don't think that I have already won it. The one thing I do, however, is to forget what is behind me and do my best to reach what is ahead. So I run straight 
toward the goal in order to win the prize, which is God's call through Christ Jesus to the life above. Everybody say amen. I run, I press on, I move forward, I move forward, I move forward. I have to show you this here, this analogy. And, and so, as I said, I'm a teacher and I love using uh, il illustrations. Somebody asked me, what is the rope for? As I was walking in, I said, well, it's to corral the goats because we have a few sheep, a lot of goats. Okay, as you know, goats will not follow a shepherd. Sheep will, but goats won't. Okay, they rebel. So as uh, you've probably seen this illustration before, so I want to show you this. This is the, the rope analogy. So now this, this rope, pretend, pretend this rope goes on and on forever and ever and ever and ever into eternity, okay? Now you see that this piece of rope right here has a little red end on it. This red end right here represents the here and now. This represents the there and there, okay? This is the here and now. This is your life right now. This is how minuscule, infantile, and embryonic your life is today in comparison to what expects us, what awaits us. Now, let me, let me make sure that I, you understand this. What awaits us depends on how we live here. Okay, so whatever happens after the finish line right here, whatever, whatever we do here to get to the finish line and transition over, what we do here will influence what happens there. Because there's only two places, heaven or hell. There's no purgatory, by the way. There's no purgatory. I grew up thinking there was purgatory because I, I grew up Catholic and I was taught there was purgatory. Pray them out of purgatory. There is no purgatory. It's heaven or hell. So we have eternal life through Christ and that's what matters here. But, but we seem to be so focused on the, the temporal the temporary, the, the joys of the moment, right? Eat today, <laughs> repent tomorrow, right? Why ask for permission or what? It's better to ask for forgiveness than it is for permission, right? Just do it. We have this just do it mindset, just do it. And we're so focused on, let me save money right here. Let me save, 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 save. So I can retire and then live really well right here. But we spin our little life here that is, the Bible says, just a vapor. Just a vapor. It's here today and gone tomorrow. That's what the Bible says, right here. We spend all of our effort and time thinking about this little portion of our life that we forget about eternity. We forget about eternity. Is what you're doing today making an eternal impact on your life or on the life of others? Or are you just living for today? Are you just living for today? I want to give you in the next few minutes, I want to conclude with five points. No, these are not the five points to have a better life in 2021. They're not. I, I stopped preaching that many, many years ago. I don't do that anymore. Because I believe that if a Christian is not going through affliction, something's wrong. Now, I'm not saying go pursue affliction. I'm not saying that because then you would need to go to a psychologist. You give me a call, fix you. That'd be wrong if you're always looking for affliction because that means that you have a victim mindset and you, you just want attention. Poor me. No, no, what I'm saying is affliction will find you. Some of you are in affliction. Some of you are coming out of affliction. Some of you are going into affliction, but you can't escape affliction. It's how you confront affliction. You know, put your priorities in order. Take that pyramid and go home and study it. When, when Claudia saw it for the very first time, she was a director at a nursing school. Can I say it? Is that okay? She was making some good money. She had a leadership position. She was doing well. She's an RN. She was doing extremely well. But when she put that thing in order, she discovered her calling. And she gave all that away. She left all of that to a higher calling. And now she works here at TFC and she's in the ministry. And to God be the glory. You need to have one of those awakenings. Here goes your five points. I call them the five R's. And I just came up with this yesterday, by the way. So it's not something that I had. The five R's and they're powerful. If you want to live a different life in 2021, follow the five R's. First R. Put it up there, please. Repent. That's the first R. Oh, man. 
Really? I thought it was going to be like some catchy and fun. Repent. <laughs> Repent. Second Chronicles 714. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and will heal their land. Listen, if you, how many of you uh, grammar teachers in the room? Any grammar teachers, English teachers? None, okay. The teachers stayed home? They don't want to get COVID. I get it. Okay. That, was, yeah, that wasn't a good joke, was it? See, at Covenant Christian Academy, we've been open since August 24. We've been open since August 24, on-site classes. Students in the classroom at the school that I'm blessed to run. Not one COVID case, my friends. Not one COVID case. August 24, we've been open and running that school with all of our children, with all of our staff, not one COVID case. Are we exempt from it? No, but we are walking in faith. We're not gonna let fear, is fear a sin? You better believe it is. You better believe fear is a sin. When you, when you replace faith with fear, it is a sin. Because you know what you're doing on the top of your pyramid of priorities? You're putting COVID. That's what you're putting at the top. COVID, or you're putting politics. Whatever you're putting. I mean, this has been a crazy year. And don't let me get political on you. <laughs> Thank you, brother. Now, I will tell you that I didn't, I, I didn't vote for a person. I voted for an agenda. I am pro-life. I am pro-family. I'm pro-military. I'm pro-law enforcement. Oh, yeah, I'm pro-Christian education. I'm pro-churches. I voted for an agenda, and don't let me get political. Let me get back over here because I'm about to run out of time. Okay, the first one is repent. The second one, oh, and by the way, I said, are there any English teachers? Because that, that verse right there, if you look at halfway after the comment, says then, that is called a conditional statement, by the way. What it means is, I will heal your land if, if, if you do what? He says, if you humble yourself, if you pray, if you seek, if you repent, then I will heal your land. Okay, number one. Number two, the second R is return. Return. And you can attach to return. Return to your first love. Return. Period of, of priorities at the very top, remember. Return. What should be at the top? God. Return. Return to your first love. In Revelation, in the book of Revelation, uh, the, there are, there, the letters are written to the different churches. And this particular letter is being written to the church at Ephesus, to the Ephesian church. And they were doing really, really well for a time. But then God says this in Revelations 2.4. He says, but I have this charge against you, that you have left your first love. You have lost the depth of love that you first had for me. So remember the heights, the heights from which you have fallen and repent Change your inner self, your old way of thinking, your sinful behavior. Seek God's will. That's from the Amplified Version. And then I don't have it up there, but let me just add on to what it says after that. He says, and do the works you did at first, when you first knew me, when you were passionate, when you were all about me. Otherwise, I will visit you and remove your lampstand. Boom. You know what that means? That luminary, that light, I will remove that light that you once had. Boom, and it'll be gone. I will remove the impact. It'll be gone if you don't return to your first love. If your first love is money, money is not the root of all evil. The love for money is the root of all evil. If you're all about the money, if you're all about the big cars and the big houses and, and, the, and the nice purses and all of that stuff that is so temporary, has no eternal value, well, then that'll be your lot in life. He says, return to your first love. Number three, the third R is renew. Renew, Romans 12, 2. Don't conform to the ways of the world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. So after you have repented, after you return back to God, then renew. Renew the way that you think. This is not a monkey see, monkey do society. Actually, it is. Don't be part of the woke cancel culture. Don't be part of that. That's idiotic, to say the least. Everything is offensive. If I confront someone because of their homosexuality, that is offensive. If I confront them because of their actions, that's offensive. 
That's messed up. If you're going to stand for the truth, you're going to stand for the truth or you're not. You're either going to agree with me today and agree not with me, but with God that, that the Bible is the truth from cover to cover, from Genesis to Revelation. Otherwise, otherwise, why are you here? Don't be part of that woke cancel culture. Renew your mind. Don't be, you know, go, go on. I have, a, I have a, a podcast episode called Monkey See, Monkey Do. Check it out. It talks all about this. You'll love it. Number four, run. Run. Hebrews 12.1. Let us also, therefore, having so great a cloud of witnesses surrounding us, listen, laying aside every weight and sin which so easily entangles us, run with endurance the race. I want to stop there. Laying aside every weight and every sin that entangles us, that trips us up. How many runners in the room? How many runners in the room? Okay, how many of you like Delias Tamales? Okay, all right. Just wanted to see, you know, the difference. That's okay. If you are a runner, if you're a runner as I am, you know that making sure that you wear the lightest shoes and the lightest clothing is going to be your best bet. You don't wear heavy stuff. You remove all the heaviness. He uses, Paul, or, or, you know, Paul used a lot of, a lot of analogies in referencing uh, running. But, but this right here in Hebrews, the author is saying, you know, strip away everything that weighs you down and that entangles you so that you can run the race set before you. So what do you do? What do you do? God, search my heart and put my thoughts, and put my thoughts to the test. Put my thoughts to the test. What do I need to renew? What do I need to renew? So three things you do. Three things you do to renew your mind. Pray, praise, read the word. Listen, pray, praise, read the word. It's that simple. Milton, how do I grow in my spirituality, my relationship with God? Praise, pray, pray praise, read the word. If you're not doing that, you're not gonna grow. And, and then the last one, the la uh, I'm sorry, the fourth uh, the last one is repeat. <laughs> Go back to one. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Constantly repent. Constantly grow. Transformation is every day. Every day. Every day. So two questions in closing for you today. Two questions in closing. I want you to think about these. What have you done this year that matters in light of eternity? The white. What have you done this year that matters in light of eternity? Think about it. Well, I got myself a new, a new pickup truck. <laughs> Does that really matter? <clears throat> Wrong answer. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. I mean, did you get one? That's good. You know, more power to you. It doesn't matter. Second question is, what have you done this year that will not be remembered when you reach eternity? That will not be remembered when you reach eternity. And to my brothers over there at the prison, at Segovia and Lopez, I want to say this. Don't look back. Don't look back. Don't let yesterday's sin entangle your tomorrow and keep you from seeing God's destiny. Don't look back. You're all children of the Most High God. Amen? Let me pray for you guys today. And as I pray, I'm also going to just, I'm going to pray, and then I'm, gonna, I'm also going to extend an invitation for those of you who don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior. But as I pray, I want to pray for, a, 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 there's, a, there's a good friend of mine, Dr. Manny Espinosa. He's one of the best urologists here in the valley, and he's, he's fighting, fighting for his life right now. He's got COVID with pneumonia. He's in the hospital, and we, I just want to lift him up in prayer this morning. Father, we come before you in the mighty and precious name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, for today's word. Thank you, Lord, that your word is like a sharper than a two-edged sword and it, and it penetrates right through the mirror and exposes everything that needs to be exposed. Father, I pray that today's word exposed whatever needs to be exposed in each and every one of us, that we would awaken, Father, that we would come to a realization, to, to uh, a consciousness, Father, of where we stand before you, Father, that we would take those, those, those five R's, Father, that we repent, repent, and repent again, and that we would return to you, Father, return back to you, to that first love, Father, that we would be, have that zeal and that passion as we did when we first came to know you, Father. Lord, that we would then renew our minds so that we can run the race that you have set before us, and then we would repeat it all over again. Father, I pray for each and every one of my brothers that are here today and sisters. I pray for my brothers at the prison pray for all of us, Father. I pray for those who are in the hospital today, for Dr. Manny Espinosa, who's also a pastor. 
I pray for his healing today in the mighty name of Jesus, Father. And for all of those who are, are at home sick or in the hospital, I pray for them, Father, that your healing anointing would descend over them, Father, and that they would come to know you with a greater hunger and a greater thirst through the affliction, Father. That the people around them, doctors, nurses, would see the testimony of your greatness through that life experience, Father. That many lives would be converted, Lord, simply by what they see, what you've done in, in your children's lives, Father. So, Father, we thank you today that you're good, that you're faithful, that you're merciful, that you're full of grace. Lord, that you love us right where we are at, but you don't want to see us stay there forever. Father, help us. Help us as we transition into a new year, which represents a new beginning, a new chapter. Help us. Help us make this a daily occurrence, not just every turn of the year, but every day, every day, every day, Father. We thank you, Lord. Those of you who are here today, who do not know Christ as Lord and Savior. In other words, you've never said yes to Jesus. Well, if you've never said yes to Jesus, then everything I preach today really has no impact on your life. Because the first thing that you have to do is accept Jesus as your Lord and Savior. There can be no transformation without Him. And so I want to extend that invitation. Everyone's heads are bowed and eyes are closed. If you're here today and you've never accepted Jesus as your Lord and Savior, would you please raise your hand so I can see who you are? You're like, I've never accepted, I've never said yes to Jesus and I really need my life to change, man. It's been, it's been hectic, it's been hard. Or, or maybe you accepted Jesus at one point and you fell away from your first love and you need to return, you need to rededicate your life to him. And today you wanna make that commitment in the eyes of God. So raise your hand if that's you. Raise your hand if that's you. Thank you, thank you, brothers. Thank you, thank you over there in the back. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, sister. Thank you. Okay, put your hands down, please. And let's all pray together. Whether you're, you're, you're saying yes to Jesus for the first time or you're rededicating your life, let's all pray this prayer together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for Jesus. Lord Jesus, I know that you're the son of God, that you died on the cross for my sins, and that you rose on the third day, and that you're seated at the right hand of the Father. Today I open up my heart, I ask for forgiveness of my sins, and I accept you as my Lord and Savior. Come live in me. As of today, I will follow you the rest of my life, and I know that I have a promise of eternal life in you. Amen. Amen.